gracious good morning, Calvary Chapel, Inverness. All right. I uh, also want to welcome our uh, internet browsers, the YouTube scrollers. Stop right here a minute and join in our worship service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is Palm Sunday, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, uh, fulfilling one of many prophecies of Jesus from the Old Testament. The, the entire Bible points to Jesus from the old to the new, and he's coming again. He's coming for us, his people. I want to point you today to what Jesus did with his friends on his final evening. He washed their feet, displaying a tender love and service to his, to his disciples. Jesus was their teacher. He was their Lord. He was their master. His signs and miracles were evidence that he is and was God. He came to serve, not to be served, to be a ransom for us and for the entire world. Later, Jesus told them, just as I have loved you, I want you to love one another. Uh, he spent his entire days on earth putting aside status in order to serve and love one another. And he said, that's how they will know that we are his disciples through our love. Um, and I missed, I messed up, but <laughs> as Jesus told his disciples, oh, anyway, I want to encourage all to consider what uh, you can do to be of service to one another, to this body here, to the entire world through our ministries like FRM that was here last week uh, detailing, you know, just horrible things going on in the world. And what we as Christians can stand in the gap against that. Um, and some of the things we need here, we need people to do AV and video and this live streaming stuff that I know nothing about. And uh, that would be a good thing. And we also need Sunday school teachers because we're starting to get some large families coming in. It's good to see other than gray heads here. And uh, let's, let's uh, give our Sunday school teachers a break. I'm signing up for one Sunday a month. And I want to encourage all of you to do the same. You know, just, just whatever you can do, like uh, Edward Agrio or whatever he said last week. You know, he, we're not looking for you to take on the whole world. We want you to just do your part to love one another here and love the community and love our world. Let's go to prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and what he's done for us. And uh, I just thank you for this church body that loves one another. I thank you for the worship team that is faithful and true every Sunday, the Sunday school teachers for our pastors and our elders and, and all those who serve here uh, faithfully, Lord. Just bless them. And Lord, as we uh, come together this morning, we just uh, thank you for your service. You died for us. You died for a wretch like me. We just give you praise and thanks. Amen.
It is just a wonderful, wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord, and especially this uh, wonderful week that we have to um, remember all that Jesus did for us and all he went through for us, and then culminating next Sunday, Easter Sunday, with Resurrection Sunday. That's what it is. You see somebody, you see somebody you say, Happy, Happy Resurrection Sunday, because that's what it is, when our Lord and Savior came out of the tomb and conquered death and the grave, hell. 
So if this is your first time here at Calvary Chapel and you would like some more information about us, ushers will be walking up and down the aisles and they have a welcome packet in your hand. Just raise your hand up and they'd be happy to give you one. Also, they have a Bible with them also. If you forgot your Bible this morning or don't own a Bible, just lift up your hand. They'll place a Bible in your hand. The passage has already been marked for today, which I'm really looking forward to. That's good. Yeah. Oh, no, I have like three. <laughs> <laughs> your king is coming how fabulous is that because he is he is on the way but if you happen to not own a bible please keep this bible take it home with you it is a gift from the lord and read it because in it are the words of life now you should have received a bulletin on your way in this morning all right and if you look on the back there's a place for you to take notes and i ask you as the holy spirit moves through the teaching today that he has given pastor kevin that you jot down Whatever he impresses on your hearts. Maybe you have questions or something, something you're not so sure of. Write it down, and you can always come back and ask later about it if you don't understand. There's nothing wrong with asking. And that's how we learn, by asking. So I ask you to please take notes. Now, on the inside, you will notice that we have a whole bunch of weekly events coming up. And I want to highlight some of them. But first, I was asked, okay, the Bloodmobile is outside. <laughs> So if you all saw that, now here, now get this. If you sign up to go give blood, you're going to get one of these bags, okay? And it's got a tumbler and a handball and a candle and, well, the gummy bears make it all worth it to give blood right there. That's, so I encourage you all, please uh, give blood and you'll get one of those nice little bags. Now getting back to our bulletin on the left side of our weekly events. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you that faith is not a spectator sport. So come on out and get involved in, in some of the stuff we do. There's lots of activities here. This coming Wednesday, we have our Through the Bible study, but we are going to take a break this Wednesday from the book of Isaiah in observance of Holy Week or Passion Week, whichever you prefer. And the study will be from the Gospel of John. Dinner will be served at 6 o'clock. So... Never mind dinner in a movie, we have dinner in a teaching. I mean, you come and you get, your, you get your, your physical body fed, and then the teaching fills our spiritual body. It's gonna be wonderful. Now, on the right side, we have upcoming events. We have a lot going on. If you look at the top, there's an abortion amendment that's gonna be heard. Good Friday service on Friday, right here at six o'clock. And then Sunday, we have resurrection service at 10 o'clock. We will also have breakfast from eight to 9.30. But here's what I want. I need your help. When the people of God all come together in prayer, in unison, agreeing on something, things happen. And everything on the right-hand side, we need to be in prayer about. Not just our resurrection service, that the Holy Spirit will move in this place. Not just Good Friday service, that the Holy Spirit will move in this place, but we have water baptism too. Let us keep this in prayer that the Holy Spirit will move upon people's hearts. If you have recently come to faith in Jesus Christ, please call the office and sign up to be baptized on Wednesday, April 3rd. And that will be, uh, sun uh, that'll be Wednesday at 6 o'clock here. But getting back to our need to prayer, I cut this article out of the paper, okay? And if you look at the top of the page, there's the abortion amendment. It's the nationwide invitation to prayer for the end of abortion and for the protection of women, men, and the preborn children. On Tuesday, April 26th, the Supreme Court of the United States will hear oral arguments in a case that has the potential to make a major impact in the widespread accessibility of chemical abortion. That's the abortion pills. Chemical abortions are now the most common form of abortion in the United States. Pro-life activists have announced a nationwide invitation to pray beginning on Monday, March 25th, the eve of the oral arguments through June 24th, which is when the court's decision is expected. I ask you all to please join me in prayer that the Holy Spirit will move in the hearts of these justices and that we can end abortion once and for all. Amen. Keep in prayer Wednesday night, the study in John. Good Friday service, it's gonna be spectacular. And Resurrection Sunday, the water baptism, we have so much to look for. You know, this may be, unless Jesus comes this week, 
hopefully this will be our last uh, Resurrection Sunday that we have to spend here, and next year we can all rejoice together in heaven. That would be wonderful. Now, we're going to prepare our hearts for our morning tithes and offerings. There's two ways to give here at Calvary Chapel. We have our agape boxes in the sanctuary, and you can also give securely online at calvaryinv.com. The men's choir is going to come to perform a song after we pray. And then after that, I ask that the children be dismissed. Our infants and toddlers to my right and your left. Our children up to 12 years of age, upstairs. I know the teachers are waiting for them. And our teens to my left and your right. So if you all join me in prayer. Oh, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and sing praises just to, to glorify you, Lord. Now, as we set our hearts, O oh Lord, to give back to you a portion of all that you have given us, Father, we pray that you will bless these tithes and offerings, O oh Lord, and multiply them, Father. That they will be used, O oh Lord God, to go forth and spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, of what he has done for us, what we could not do for ourselves. You did, O oh Lord. Just bless us all this day. Bless our giving, Father, and touch our hearts. And as we just settle our hearts, O oh Lord, to hear from you today, Father. Bless Pastor Kevin's teaching. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Good morning, everyone. God bless you. So good to see you here on the Lord's Day at Calvary Chapel. Looking forward to what he's going to say to us through his word. Let's open our Bibles to the gospel according to John. The gospel according to John will begin in chapter 12, uh, verse 12. And as Ernie said, all this week we're going to follow the footsteps of Christ as he makes his way to give his life as a ransom for many. And the question may be, why, why do we do this? Because what we, what we will read today and what we know is that this is not just uh, events for the sake of tradition. These are not random events, but they are founded in and established in uh, Old Testament prophecy concerning the person of Jesus Christ and the purpose of his coming. And I just wanted to get down deep into our soul and just that we may have the confidence and grow in confidence that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's coming back for his people uh, very, very soon. And we know this because he's fulfilled every uh, prophecy sp spoken of about his first coming. I've entitled our passage today, Behold, Your King is Coming. Let's offer this Bible study to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, a day where we can gather together in your name. It's beautiful not just for the sole purpose of the weather. It's beautiful because of the freedom that you have granted us to gather in your name. The freedom from sin and the power of sin. And the freedom of uh, death, Lord. The fear of death. Because we know that as we place our faith in you, you liberate us from that fear. Because we know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that we will spend eternity face to face with you along with all those from all the centuries who have placed their faith in you. We thank you, Lord, that what we read today is not just a random event, but they've all been orchestrated and determined by your Father in heaven long before the foundation of the world, revealed to the prophets and apostles of the Old and New Testament concerning your life, your death, your burial, your resurrection and your imminent return. So, Lord, may we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. May we be firmly established in the faith. May we boldly and courageously live out this uh, gospel life, Lord, and share with others what you have done. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to understand what you, the Spirit, would say to us, the church. Give us a heart to receive this glorious gospel for truly is glorious, and it is the good news that has transformed us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. John writes this in chapter 12, verse 12, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, said on it, As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written. A very important phrase. What things? The things that had transpired before their very eyes had been written about him, and they had done these things to him. Therefore, verse 17, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. What a beautiful passage. 
Again, these things are not random, and they're not just there for tradition's sake. I know that we traditionally call today Palm Sunday. Maybe you grew up in a tradition where it's called the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Uh, Whether we call it Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry, it is the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem to give his life as a ransom for many. And all of it was foreordained by God the Father long before the foundation of the world and revealed these events that would take place to the prophets of old. One of the prophecies that we will look at this morning regarding Palm Sunday was written 2,500 years earlier. And God is a God of detail, and only God can prophesy. In fact, I heard someone say, and I wrote this in my prayer letter last night, God foretells the future as if it has already taken place in the past. I love that about God. When God foretells the future, he speaks of it as if it's already taken place in the past. Only God can prophesy. And as we go through these things, and listen, many of you, and I hope, maybe hopefully all of you know these things and know uh, the events that surrounded Jesus coming to Jerusalem, but may it get down deep into our soul and firmly establish us and give us a joy of knowing that our king, what he has done, and what he is doing today, and that very soon he is going to come for us. We're told in the beginning of the chapter, it was six days before the Passover. That's the feast, the Passover feast, when uh, Jews from all over the Roman Empire would descend upon the city of Jerusalem to commemorate uh, their exodus uh, from Egypt, from the bondage of Egypt. It was a required feast. Josephus, the uh, the Jewish historian, said there's somewhere between 2.5 and 2.7 million uh, pilgrims who had made their way to Jerusalem to commemorate this feast. And for those who have been to Jerusalem, especially the old city, you know how narrow the roads are and how crowded it is. And so, but it wouldn't have been, the hustle and bustle have been one of uh, joy because they were there to celebrate God liberating them from the tyranny of, of bondage of Egypt. And so that's what we are doing today. We are celebrating that God has liberated us from the tyranny and bondage of sin. Sin that has destroyed so many. Sin that leads us to hell. Sin that uh, isolates us not only from God, but from one another. And we're here today to celebrate that Jesus has come to liberate us from that bondage and to give us power over that sin. And one day he will remove us from the presence of sin to be with him forever. And before he came to Jerusalem, he stopped by Bethany, which is only a a short two miles outside the city. And there he had come for a dinner celebration with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Yes, that Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. And so there was a dinner that was hosted in his honor to give God thanks for what he had done through his son Jesus and bringing Lazarus back to life. The scripture didn't tell us how Lazarus felt about it. I cannot imagine it being something that he was really looking forward to because he was in the presence of the Lord. He was getting ready to bite down on a leg of lamb or some choice piece of beef at the marriage supper. And right before he could sink his teeth in it, not having to worry about calories or saturated fats or anything like that, or too many carbs or not enough carbs or too much salt or not enough salt, right before he chomped into that precious, awesome, beautiful beef or lamb, boom, he's right back here on earth. No one tells us how he felt about it, so, uh, but everybody else was celebrating that he was back. And it tells us that it was hosted, Matthew and Mark tell us it was hosted, this dinner, in the house of Simon. And that doesn't seem like a big deal until Matthew and Mark both tell us it was Simon the leper. There's only one reason that a leprous man could host a dinner. It's because someone had cleansed him from that leprosy. Leprosy is a picture of sin and that you're not healed of leprosy. Only a divine act of God can cleanse you from leprosy and it's representation of God through his son cleansing us from sin. And so Simon hosted this dinner celebration in the house and it was packed full of friends and family, Martha, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, Jesus, and the 12 disciples. 
And it says that when they left there the next day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem for the final time. And it was, again, not a random event. In fact, there had been many conspiring to keep him from entering in Jerusalem. And I don't know if that was on their mind specifically to keep him from entering Jerusalem, but it was on Satan's mind. It was on Satan's mind that he could not allow Jesus to come into Jerusalem and he could not allow him to give his life as a ransom for many. So Satan used wicked men to plot his demise. We're told over and over again that the chief priest plotted to put him to death. We're told that the Pharisees plotted to put them to death. And the hatred of the Pharisees and chief priests were so great for Jesus, they decided to go ahead and put that, uh, Lazarus to death again because he was the sign that Jesus was from God. Imagine that. Lazarus said, I didn't ask to come back here, and now that I am back here, they're plotting my demise. They're trying to kill me for the simple reason that Jesus has resurrected me from the dead. And so, actually, again, that's a picture of us today. The world hates us. The world wants nothing to do with the church. The world works against the church, ultimately because of their hatred for Jesus Christ. And we're told that they plotted and planned and conspired to keep him uh, from coming to Jerusalem, and they wanted to put him to death before he went to the cross. And to get in on the scene, Herod, who was also a wicked man, was used by Satan to try and to join the conspiracy and put him to death. Luke records this in chapter 13, verse 32, when Jesus was told that Herod was seeking his demise. How does Jesus respond? Go tell that fox. I like that. You go call that deceiver, and you go call that, this, uh, that schemer, that behold, or pay attention to this, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day, I shall be perfected. Otherwise, I will complete the assignment that has been given to me. I will perform miracles. I will go to a cross. I will be buried. And on the third day, God, my Father, will resurrect me out from among the dead to never die again. And then Jesus goes on to say in Luke 13, verse 33, Nevertheless, I must, and the word must is an imperative, it's a command. I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. The reason Jesus was going to Jerusalem was not only to give his life as a ransom for many, but Old Testament prof, uh, prophecy dictated that he must go to Jerusalem to die for the sins of his people. Again, not a random event. The city chosen was not random. The day was not random. The, the, the events surrounding his crucifixion were not random. The, the events surrounding Palm Sunday were not written. They were all established firmly in Old Testament prophecy. And how sad it is, and I know that we don't do this here, and I know that there are many churches that don't do this, but there seems to be a growing number of churches in the world today that are disassociating themselves from the Old Testament, saying that we are New Testament believers. And yes, we are New Testament believers, but how can you really understand uh, prophecy? How can you understand the work of Messiah, the work of Jesus Christ, without understanding first that it was foretold in the Old Testament? So you're only getting partial gospel. You need all the uh, 66 books of the Bible. And so that's why we come to chapter 12. We want to look at the Old Testament prophecies that foretold the events surrounding Jesus coming to Jerusalem. And the first one is in verse 12, and it's rooted in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 26, a prophecy that was written 2,500 years before uh, Jesus entered into the city. And it says here in verse 12, the next day after being in Bethany with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So what today we call that day Palm Sunday. It literally was four days before the feast of Passover. Again, somewhere between 2.5 and 2.7 million people had crowded into the city of Jerusalem. And among that, 
And John uses the phrase, a great multitude of the 2.5 to 2.7 million people had come there specifically to see Jesus because they heard he was there. Among those that are there to see Jesus are those from his Galilean ministry that he had healed, those with blinded eyes, those with deaf ears, those who had been lame at one time, those who had been zest with demons. And of course, Lazarus would have been there. Simon would have been there. And one that would have touched my heart, there was a synagogue ruler that had become a believer in Jesus by the name of Jairus. Because Jairus had heard of the miracle working power of Jesus and came to him because he said, come to my house, lay hands on my little daughter. She's only 12 years old. She is the love of my life. She's the apple of my eye and she is dying. But if you will come, she will live. So Jesus graciously uh, begins to walk with Jairus, and along the way, they're interrupted by a woman that Mark tells us who had been bleeding internally for 12 long years and had spent all her wealth on physicians. Instead of getting better, she became worse. Sounds like health care today, doesn't it? So it's right. So she spent everything she had. Instead of getting better, she became worse. And she came and she had the thought that if I just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch Jesus, I know everything is going to be well. And so she does. The Lord stops the procession, says, who touched me? What he was saying is, who touched me in faith? And she came forward, and he says, your faith, daughter, called her daughter, your faith, oh daughter, has healed you, literally has saved you, has made you whole. Now, the problem with this is excited as she was and as excited the crowd was to see this miracle, it stopped Jesus from going to Jairus' house long enough for Jairus to receive the news, don't bother the master anymore because your daughter has died. For those in here today, when it's a husband or a wife, a child, a grandchild, brother or sister, when you receive the news of death, it grips your heart. And yet, as we know, that Jesus went to Jairus' house and he looked at that little girl and said, Daughter, rise. And she did. And Jesus took her by the hand and gave her back to her parents. So I believe that Jairus was there in Jerusalem. I believe the woman who had been bleeding internally for 12 long years and had spent all she had on physicians, and instead of getting better, she became worse, but has healed by Jesus. She was there. I believe the Gadarene demoniac who had a legion of demons, he was there. I believe that the widow of nine whose only son had died, and in the funeral procession, Jesus stopped them in the middle of the procession, went up to the... Uh, the place where the child, the boy was laying and caused him to get up and gave him back to her, his mother. That was all. They were also there. Everybody was there to see Jesus at the feast of Passover. And again, this was not just a random day. This had been foretold 2,500 years earlier and revealed to Daniel the prophet. If you have your Bibles, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 Daniel, who had just heard the news that after 70 long years of captivity, his people had been set free according to the prophecy of Jeremiah and sent back to Jerusalem. So he began to pray and he began to seek the face of God on what was next for his people. An angel came, told Daniel while he was praying, you are highly esteemed in heaven. Wouldn't he love to hear that when you're praying? So many times we, when we pray, we think, oh, God, you know, I have not been what I should be. I know that you don't have to listen to me. I don't know if you are listening to me and how good it is to know that an angel appeared to Daniel. And by the way, the Holy Spirit speaks the same thing to our life. You are highly loved. You are highly esteemed in heaven. And this was the prophecy that was revealed to Daniel. Now, Daniel didn't know this was about Palm Sunday, but he knew that God was giving him and revealing to him the future. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the angel told Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, 
to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks literally is what some Bible commentators call Daniel's 70 weeks of sevens. And as we follow along in the Hebrew scriptures, we, we find out that 70 weeks literally are 70 years. There, and it, when you multiply it by the 70 years times seven, we find out that God told Daniel in 490 years, that's what 70 times seven, 490 years, this is what will happen. I will bring an end to sin. I will bring an end to transgression. I will make a way for reconciliation for iniquity. That is the cross. Daniel, whether he realized it or not, and the cross didn't even exist as an instrument of torture that day. God was revealing to Daniel the way he would make an end to sin, the way he would make an end to transgression, the way he would reconcile people to him is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to speak of the future, even for us, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's speaking of a literal, physical, thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem. To seal up vision and prophecy, by the time that the millennium comes, every prophecy, every vision will have been fulfilled. And to anoint the most holy, that is, to anoint Jesus, to be the king of all the earth in a new temple. And so Daniel had this revealed to him. 490 years, 490 prophetic years, and then the end shall come. He goes on to say in verse 25, Know therefore and understand, God wants us to know Bible prophecy. Why? So we can see that the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem is not random. It's foreordained by God. It has been determined, it has been ordained, it has been appointed. It was appointed and determined that Jesus would arrive in Jerusalem that very day according to what God revealed to the prophet Daniel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. So the angel reveals to Daniel when this prophetic time clock is going to begin. When does the 490 years it's going to bring an end to sin and for the cross to take place, when is it going to begin? He tells us it begins when the command goes forth to restore and build Jerusalem. Remember, the Jews have been in captivity for 70 years. So do we have something in Old Testament Scripture that tells us when that command went forth? We won't take the time to do that today, but if you're taking notes, it's Nehemiah chapter 2. When King Artaxerxes commissioned Nehemiah, his cupbearer, to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. Historians tell us that with that edict went out on March 14th, 445 B.C. King Artaxerxes gave the command to his cupbearer, Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 2, to leave his position there in uh, Persia and travel back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city. We're told that as he, it, it took 49 years for the city to be completed to what it used to be. And we're told that it was completed during troublesome times. As you go through the book of Nehemiah, you read about the enemies of God, those nations that surround Israel, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Samaritans. They oppose, they ridicule, they mock, and they conspired to kill Nehemiah and to stop the rebuilding of the city. That's what's taking place in the Middle East today. Israel's attacked on October 7th of last year, and now that their PR campaign is being lost because now the world, including our own beloved nation, is telling that Israel must stop short of completing the mission of wiping out Hamas because they are completing in the eyes of the UN and the eyes of our United States, they're, com uh, they're committing genocide against the Palestinian people, and it's the farthest thing from the truth. 
We, as the United States, we would never allow another country to tell us to stop pursuing our enemies when we have been provoked. Could you imagine that happened during World War II? Oh, yes, uh, Pearl Harbor has been bombed, but you've got to be nice to these people. You, you need to send them aid, and you need to send them food, and you need to try to come up with them. No, here's our idea. Here's our idea. We're going to nuke you out of existence for attacking us. And you say, you're, you're a pastor, I can't believe you think that way. Listen. As far as I understand, God commissions us as a nation to protect its citizens. Every nation is called by God to protect its citizens. And so here we have that God tells uh, Daniel through the angel that for, in 49 years, which will be 40, seven, seven weeks, that's 49 years, and then after that, another 62 weeks, 434 years. You put those two together and you come up with 483 prophetic years years and then we come to verse 26 now if you take i know it's a math lesson no one came to church to hear a math lesson but it's very important 490 years have been prophesied until the end comes 483 years pass by that began with the rebuilding of the city of jerusalem 490 minus 483 it leaves us seven years Sound familiar to anybody? There's seven more prophetic years left, and then the end shall come. But something has stopped that time clock. We have had all these years go by, 2,000 years go by, when there's still seven final years to be completed. Verse 26, it says, And after the 62 Weeks, otherwise the 483 years, Messiah shall be cut off. So what stopped the prophetic time clock was Messiah being cut off. Literally, the phrase cut off, it all, if you go through what's called expositional consistency, cut off always means put to death. Always. It's not just alienating you from your family or you being excommunicated from a community. Literally, to be cut off means he was put to death. What stopped the prophetic time clock at 483 years was Messiah's death. It says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So, March 14th, 445 B.C., Nehemiah is commissioned to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. 483 years pass by, and we come to this day, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, not by happenstance, not by coincidence, not the luck of the draw. It wasn't from, you know, just casting the dice. It was foreordained by God. Jesus, we're told by history, rode into Jerusalem on April 6, A.D. 32. Why is that significant? The commission, the, the, being commissioned to rebuild Jerusalem March 14th, 445 B.C. to April 6, A.D. 32 equals exactly 173,880 days. Okay, what does that mean? If you use the calendar that they used, 173,880 days equals 483 years. So when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what we traditionally call Palm Sunday, it was on the exact date that God had foreordained before the foundation of the world and revealed to Daniel the prophet 2,500 years earlier. Today is more than just tradition it's more than just us celebrating Jesus coming it is the fulfillment of a 2,500-year-old prophecy. In verses, uh, verse 13 now, the praise, the way the, the multitude praised him was rooted in Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. It tells us in verse 13, the multitude took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out literally continually, Hosanna! So Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem on the back of, the, of a young donkey, the colt of a donkey, and as he's riding into the streets, 
there's a spontaneous reaction of the multitude lining the streets and they are waving palm branches at him. Where in the world did that come from? It's first of all, palm branches were used not in the feast of Passover, but in the feast of tabernacles. Tabernacles was a seven day feast that God gave Israel to celebrate his provision for them in the 40 years of the wilderness. It also speaks of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so they pick up the palm branches to celebrate, in their mind, this conquering king coming into the city of Jerusalem. Back during the Maccabean age, when Rome was uh, terrorizing Israel, the Maccabees were successful in the re revolt for many years. They cast the Romans out and the Greeks out of the uh, temple. They cleansed the temple and rededicated the temple. And the multitude at that time celebrated the Maccabean uh, victory by waving palm branches. It's a sign of military conquest. And so it says they took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna, Hosanna, that's a praise song for us. But literally the word Hosanna is not a praise song. It's literally a cry for help. It literally means God help me now or God save me now. And it comes literally from Psalm 118 verse 25. Hosanna, save now, help me now. And look at verse 13, the rest of verse 13. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're using messianic title. They're, they're, crying, they're using the Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26, the exact same verbiage, crying out, and they're attributing that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the King, that he is the one that the Old Testament has prophesied about. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. But, did, but were they telling the truth? Is this, this is from the conviction of their heart. What they did is they, they recounted Psalm 118, verse 25. 20. There was nobody there. There was not like our, our men's choir. They get together on Tuesday night to practice the hymn. There was no one in the street. So, okay, everybody on the left side of the street, and everybody on the right side, pick up your palm proms, and here's what we're going to do. We are going to sing Psalm 118 as Jesus comes through the streets. Again, Psalm 18 was known as one of the Hallel Psalms, the Hallelujah Psalms. It was not used during the commemoration of Passover, but in the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. Why did they do that? Because long before the city of Jerusalem expected their king, God moved upon a king by the name of David who wrote this psalm. And they used it that day. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Here's the problem that we're going to find out. The same multitude that said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is the same multitude in just a few days will cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And when Pilate says, what has this man done? I find him innocent of your charges. And then the multitude cries out, being spurred on by the Pharisees, they, he claims to be a king. What You just said he was a king. And now they're saying, he says he's a king, and we have no king but Caesar. Why would they do this? Because they missed the purpose of Christ's coming. They saw Jesus as a political savior. They saw him setting up his kingdom there in Jerusalem, and that will take place one day, but it wasn't for that day. They saw him as a military savior, that he would defeat the tyranny of Rome once and for all and kick them out, and they would have their nation given back to them. Jesus didn't come as a political savior. Jesus didn't come as a military savior. He came as our redeemer, as one who would go to the cross and die for our sins. The angel told Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, and she, being Mary, will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He wasn't there to save them from Rome. He wasn't there to set up a theocracy. He was there to save people from their sins. That is the assignment given to us, the church, that we are to proclaim the gospel 
that for us, Americans can be saved from their sins. Yes, we vote. Ruth and I voted in the primary last week. I will vote in November. I will cast my vote on who I believe should be president of our nation. But I don't look at the president as our savior. I don't look as our military as our savior. I look to Jesus Christ and the assignment he has given me is to let everybody know that he who was born of a virgin has come for the express purpose of saving, delivering, cleansing, healing people from their sins. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, said the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Peter, when preaching in Cornelius' house, the Gentile, said to him, speaking of Jesus, all the prophets witnessed that through his name, and I love this, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. The people weren't looking for that. The reason they wanted to crucify him is because he, he did not meet up to their expectations. They had determined what their Savior looks like. But what we're doing here is we're celebrating what the Bible tells us about our Savior, not about what politics says about our Savior, not what the military says about our Savior, not what the culture says about our Savior. Have you been hearing what the culture says about our Savior? All I can say is, yuck, no, that's not my Savior. I don't know what Jesus you're speaking of, but the Jesus I know would never tolerate what you're doing, would never agree with it. The Bible tells us the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, that's the good, the bad, the ugly. And as you know, if you come here, I'm not talking about your looks. And that's a good thing. We're saved no matter how good our heart is or how bad our heart is or how ugly our heart is. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. That's why today we can say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. My king has come. My savior has come according to Bible prophecy. And I have been cleansed of my sin. Not because of anything that I have done, but what he has done for me. In verses 14 and 15, the, the procession, the very procession that was taking place is rooted in Zechariah. Chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. He said, then Jesus, when he had found a donkey, said on it, as it is written. Zechariah wrote about the transportation that Jesus would use to ride into Jerusalem. Matthew gives us more details about this. Let me take a moment and read this. Matthew 21 and 1. Now when they had drew, drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Listen, Jesus is prophesying to them. Here's what you need to do, guys. The village opposite of where we are, I want you to go there. And when you arrive there, you will immediately, and not it tells them immediately, find a donkey and its colt. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, I don't know who Jesus sent, but you know they had to discuss among themselves, uh, I'm not real comfortable with this. Uh, I'm supposed to, the first donkey I find with a colt, I'm supposed to loose them. And just by happen chance, the owner sees me. Does he call the cops? Does he pull out a shotgun? Does he come at me with a bat of some kind? What do I do? And so I just need to tell him that Jesus needs him. And he'll say, oh, it's okay, no problem. So you have to understand that I, I believe it was Peter was one of them because this sounds like something Peter would have to do. P I believe Peter would say, what Peter did or Hoover it was, it was an act of faith. That's what we're doing here. We're here because of faith, our faith in Jesus. And as we're celebrating his coming, there are things that he commissions us to do. And I'm going to tell you, it's an act of faith to do them. It's not going to be stranger than go into the next village 
And as soon as you arrive in that village, you'll see a donkey and its colt. I want you to loose them and bring them here to me. And if anybody says anything to you, just tell them I said I need it, and they will let that go. That's an act of faith. I used this example. I'm speaking to someone earlier this week. When Joshua and the children of Israel came to the banks of the Jordan River, they had been commissioned to cross the Jordan River into Canaan, which is Israel today, the promised land. And it says that the priests led the procession with the Ark of the Covenant. Joshua goes out of his way by the Holy Spirit to tell us in Joshua chapter 3 that the Jordan bank was at flood stage. So you can imagine the priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and this was something holy, this was something sacred, and they knew they, if they stumbled, it could have vast consequences on them. And understand, as they came to the bank of the river, some of us, and I'm saying I'd probably do the same thing, I would wait for the river to part before I walked through. That's not what happened. We live not by sight, but by faith. It wasn't until the big toe of the first priest stepped its into that cold Jordan River, and at flood stage, meaning there's a, a strong current going there, but finally, one of those priests had to have enough boldness, enough courage, enough faith to take God at his word and put his foot, and I believe it's a big toe first, to see how cold it was the moment he did that. Then God parted the Jordan River. Come on, pastor, do you believe that? Yes, I do. Why? Because it's written in the word of God. And the word of God can never lie. It's never incomplete. It never uh, distracts me. It always fulfills what it says. And so they walked across on dry land. It wasn't until the disciples that Jesus told to go find the colt, until they went, did they see God at work. So they retrieved the colt and come back. Jesus is on the back of a colt. Mark tells us that it was prophesied it would not just be a donkey, but actually a colt. And then they quote Zechariah chapter 9, verse 15. Fear not. Stop being afraid, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, why is that important that it's a donkey's colt? Because in that day, when a king went to go visit his citizens, if he came in peace, he rode on a donkey. If he had come to conquer, he rode on the back of a horse. And so when he rode on the back of a young colt, it was a sign to those in Jerusalem, I've come not to conquer you, I have come in peace that you may be saved from your sins. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I'll raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, verse 6, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Literally, Lord is Yahweh or Jehovah or I am. The, the title I am is that God is saying, I am the all-becoming one. I am whatever you need me to be. What they needed that day was a right relationship with God. Jesus saying to them by coming in peace, he says, I am the way for you to be made right with God. He is also... Uh, our provider. He is also our healer. He is also our shepherd. He is also our peace. The Lord, our shepherd. The Lord, our provider. The Lord, our healer. The Lord, our savior. The Lord, our righteousness. He has come to make us right with God. Now, there is a second coming that we're told about when the heavens will open, and Jesus will not be riding the back of a colt. He'll be riding the back of a horse. Revelation chapter 19, so the heavens open, and he shall descend with the armies of heaven and with the saints of God. 
That's us, by the way. And we will all be on the back of a horse, and he'll be riding to make war and to judge the Christ-rejecting world. And But at this time, he had come in peace. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Just as Israel was waiting for the coming of the Messiah, we are also waiting for Messiah to return. Not to come the first time, but to return. And when he returns, he will save us from the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? It's that seven-year period that Christ called the tribulation. A, a day so horrible that unless God cut it short, no flesh would survive. Let me go back to our math thing. 490 prophetic years. 483 have taken place. The clock has been stopped. There's a seven-year period still awaiting. When does that start again? It starts again when God will raise up a world leader who will confirm a peace treaty with Israel for seven years. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Seven years. That'll begin that time clock again of the outpouring of his wrath upon the earth to bring all of it to a close, the climactic end. And here Hebrews is telling us that as we wait for his second coming, he will save us from that time of wrath. The church will not be here. There's seven years still to take place, but the church will not be here for that. So just as Israel waited for the coming of Messiah the first time, so we, the church, are waiting for the Messiah to return for us. And finally, we have here in verses 6 through 19 is the responses of the disciples, the Pharisees, and the people. It says here in verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. That's why you having a relationship with your Bible is so vital to your Christian walk. The disciples did not understand what was taking place until they read what had been written. Look, I think too many of us depend on church in various forms, the small groups, the Bible studies, the various Bible studies, the, the Wednesday nights, the Sundays, the home groups uh, for us, for our knowledge of the Bible. It is to be simply a supplement to us. We need to have that daily time in the Word of God. Why, why is that important? Well, I'll tell you one reason, because the deception is so strong today. There's so many things being thrown at you from every different direction, and we're told that the Holy Spirit speaks through his word to guide us into all truth, to remind us of everything that Christ has said, to remind us who we are in him and what awaits us. And listen, this is not, this is not made upon are you a good reader or your educational level. They're the most brilliant of people today. When they read the Bible, it makes no sense to them because they lack what you and I have, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. He illuminates the eyes of our heart that we may understand this. It's not just to be a book that's boring to us or made up of chronology, ge uh, genealogies and chronological historical events. It's a living book. And it guides us into all truth. And so I just encourage you, as we go through Passion Week and as we go beyond Passion Week, that you develop a personal relationship with the Word of God, that it become vital to your life, that you cherish it like a friend. I remember my dad telling me about uh, someone in his church many years ago who had been married maybe over 60 years. And, of course, when his wife passed, there was this loneliness that he experienced. And he was asked, you know, how, how did you get through the loneliness? He said it was the Word of God. The Word of God became my spouse. It became my friend. It became my comforter. Why is it? Because it's a living book. It, it's not a stale book. It's, a, it's, a, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
and reminds us of the promises of God. It guides us into all truth and shows us our future. If you're lonely today, if you're weak today, if you're sick today, if you're confused about what's going on in the world today, develop a relationship with the Word of God. Because I believe, and my ministry is based on this, our church is based on this. It is the Spirit of God speaking the Word of God to transform the hearts of the people of God. I believe that. That's a mountain I'm willing to die on. The Spirit of God speaking through the Word of God to transform the heart of the people of God. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and they had done these things to him. One last note on this is that when we see what's happening and you know, all the events that are taking place, for those who have a relationship with the word of God, say, oh, I know what that is. We're one day closer to Christ returning. As John, Jan Markell says of Olive Tree View Ministries, things are not out of control. Literally, things are falling into place. I like that. The second group, verse 17, Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. Those people who were there bore witness to these things. It's not that they were theologians. They just bore witness to an eyewitness account of what they saw. The blind man that was healed by Jesus, he was questioned by the Pharisees on how this miracle took place. How does he account for this? that Jesus was able to do this. And I love what John writes about that. The blind man answered and said, whether he is a sinner being Jesus or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's all it takes to be a witness. What Jesus has done for you. The people who witnessed these things began to share with others what they saw, what they heard, what they experienced. And that's that's the assignment of us as a church. What we've seen, what we've heard, what the Lord has done in our life. You may be like, I don't know, I can't do that on my own. It says here in verse 18, for this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. They didn't do this in their own strength. They did this by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now we have the response of the Pharisees, verse 19. You think they're celebrating this? No. The Pharisees, along with the chief priest, plotted to kill him. (laughs) I think it's funny. I only know I think it's funny that God thinks it's funny. In Psalm chapter 2, it tells us that the kings of the earth conspire against God and his anointed. How does God and the, the anointed one, Jesus, respond? They scoff at him. And here they try to overthrow the kingdom of God and his son. And yet it says in Psalm 2 that God responds and says, Yet I will instill my son on my holy hill. Otherwise, he is setting up the kingdom of Christ, his son. No matter what the kings of the earth do. Therefore, they said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. We are those who have gone after him, are we not? We have seen who he is. We saw the wretched condition of our soul. And we have turned to him in faith and placed our faith in him. So why is this passage important? I leave you with this and then we'll pray. John 20, verse 30. And truly, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. Verse 31. But these are written, including this passage we just read, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, literally continuing to believe, you may have life in his name. So for us who are saved, the reason we go through these passages like Passion Week is that it may strengthen our faith in our decision to follow him. It It may strengthen us in our faith to know that none of this was random or by happen chance. It was all foreordained before the foundation of the world and revealed to the prophets of old that you and I may benefit and also be able to share with those 
what God has done that they may also believe. That's why we do these things. I'm so glad Jesus came. He came to save us, and he's coming again to save us from the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these things. And Lord, a lot of material here, and it's not about remembering dates and days, but remembering that nothing happened without being foreordained by you. And Lord, some of that is the moment that you bring a loved one into our path, and you open up a door for us to speak into their life, that we may share the purpose of your coming, the reason you've come to earth. And so, Lord, we, we look to you that we might be witnesses of you to those around us. And, Lord, for those who are shaken by the world's events, may this passage, by the power of your Spirit, just establish them in peace. You are the Lord, our peace. You bring shalom to our life. You calm the troubled soul. You, you calm the voices in our head, Lord. I pull at us. You are our righteousness. You are the way to make, we are made right with your Father in heaven. You are a provider. You are our healer. You are our shepherd. A shepherd that cares for us daily. Meeting our needs. Physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. You called yourself the good shepherd. You have laid down your life for us. And not only did you do that, but you live for us today. May every one of us realize that you are our shepherd. Where we can say, Jesus, you are my shepherd. You care for me. You guide me. You feed me. You strengthen me. And Lord, whatever we need, you said that you're able to meet that need. So Lord, in closing in prayer today, for those who would just say, yes, Lord, I need you to be this. For those who need Jesus to be their right way to God. Anybody here today in the live stream that realizes they're not right with God, that Jesus is the way to be made right with God. For those who are weak and sick and maybe even been given a terminal diagnosis, Jesus says, I am your healer. Lord, for those who are sick or for those who have a loved one that are sick and for those caregivers who might have been able to break away and spend time here in the sanctuary, maybe even on the live stream, not only are you the healer of the one they're caring for, but you are their healer. You are their strength. Lord, for those who are just, they just don't have enough to even make it through the month, the week, or even the day, you are the Lord, their provider. Lord, for those who are grieving today, because we know that we have family members who are here because of the recent passing of a loved one, you are the Lord, their comforter. The comforter is the one that stands alongside of them and encouraging them with the truths of the word of God. You comfort us when we grieve, Lord. You heal us when we are sick. You provide us when, we're, when we are in need. You shepherd us so we know that we're not orphans and we're not alone. And you have made us right with God. We thank you for these things, Lord. As we go through the rest of this week, Lord, may those events that took place 2,000 years ago during Passion Week, may they be embedded on our soul, rooted and grounded and establish us in the faith, Lord. Not the traditions of the church per se, but the truths of Scripture of what you have done. And then just as Israel waited for the first coming Messiah, Lord, we the church are waiting for your second coming. What a day, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Pastoral care team will be here in the altar. Yes. So we'll close out with a song. And if you need prayer today, the, the men will be down here and they'd love to pray with you. God bless you. At the cross, at the cross, we're